Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on making innovative public sector organisations with our special guest, Michael Trogger from the IP Australia. Um, we'll get, kick off. I'm sure there'll be more people join as we, we go along, but just some quick housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and we'll make it available on our YouTube account uh, in the near future. We do encourage questions, uh, so please use the, the chat box and we'll try to answer as many of them as we can. And there are two hashtags for today, uh, one OPSI webinar and Innovation Month 2020. Uh, for we are a part of Innovation Month Online, Australia's Public Sector Innovation Network's uh, Innovation Month, with the theme this year of Delivering Differently. Uh, and we're very pleased to be a part of that program. Um, before we dive into uh, the, the presentation proper though, I'm going to uh, just ask a few questions um, of the audience. Um, through a platform called WooClap, just to get us, give us a little feel for uh, who's online today and um, where you're from and what you're interested in. I'll just put the link in the chat. And I'm going to ask you to uh, log on there through a browser. You don't have to log in or anything. You just uh, join the website and um, answer a few uh, short questions. The first thing, uh, what sector are people from today? Where are people joining? I suspect there'll be quite a lot from government, but it's always helpful to test our assumptions. So we've got a little bit of a mix. And the next question I'm going to move to, I'm gonna go through these fairly rapidly, sorry, but hopefully that's okay, is to ask where uh, are you joining from? So you just have to tap on the, the map as to where you're from or where you're joining us from today. Getting quite a concentration from Australia, which is good, but also quite a few from Europe and some very keen person from Mexico who must be up extraordinarily early. Next, uh, just a couple of questions to help baseline us about our audience today. Um, would you say that the organization you work with or in is very innovative? Do you strongly agree, agree, mixed about it, disagree or, or strongly disagree? just to give us a bit of a feel for what sort of uh, level of innovation, sophistication um, people are familiar with on their day-to-day -day basis. So we're getting quite a few agrees, but also quite a number of neither agree nor disagree. And only a few strongly agree, some disagree, but no one strongly disagreeing yet, which is encouraging. Okay, and the next question is, the organization I work in with has a deliberate and explicit approach to innovation. It's good to see a few there with the 
strongly agreeing, quite a number agreeing, but also obviously a number who disagree. Again, no one strongly disagreeing though. Interesting. And then one final question, which is a bit more open-ended. Um, what you want to hear most about today is? And then I realize I've left the firewall on, so I may have to refresh manually, sorry. So quite a mix, innovating in a risk averse environment, that's something we're all familiar with, how to involve staff, leadership, how to measure success, inspiring practices, examples, how to engage all the staff to innovate. Quite a few here. You know, it's the best place to start. Key challenges in public sector, how to build an innovative culture, new challenges, pushing through red tape, how to bridge politics to doing, how to best involve external stakeholders, best practices. Okay, it's quite a mix there, but Michael and I will try and make sure we do our best to cover as many of these as possible in our chat. So thank you for that. Oh, no, I've said the wrong thing. I think I'd be getting better at this, but. Um, so just quickly, for those who might not be very familiar with us at the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation at the OECD, uh, we focus on three broad things. Uh, we look at uncovering what is next. And just uh, last week, we released our uh, mini trends report on COVID responses, innovative COVID responses by governments around the world. We also look at turning the new into the normal. Uh, so how do we embed promising practices? Uh, we've provided a, a draft primer recently on rules as code, which explores some of that. And we try and act as a source of trusted advice for governments on how to take a deliberate and consistent approach to innovation. And that's what leads us to today's conversation with our special guest, Michael Schwager, the Director General of IP Australia. Uh, hello, Michael. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Alex. Thank you for having me to this interesting event. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so I might just give a little sense of why are we talking about uh, IP Australia and uh, talking with you about making an innovative public sector in an organisation. Well, I have a, a bit of a history with Michael. Uh, we used to work together at the Department of Industry in Australia. But I've also gotten to see uh, IP Australia's innovation journey over the years. And one of those instances was uh, a case study we featured in our innovation trends report in, back in 2017 on the Australian trademark search, which was a fairly extensive innovation in terms of uh, helping the business uh, become better at engaging or well, making services easier and more accessible to users. Uh, we've also seen quite a number of other innovations. Uh, we've, we're hoping to feature another one in one of our upcoming mini trends reports. And IP Australia has had a long history of uh, winning awards for innovative measures and having a deliberate and explicit approach to innovation. One of the things we see in our work at the observatory is there's a lot of innovation that happens in the public sector. Uh, just recently, this crisis has unleashed and unlocked a huge amount of innovation. We have over 400 different innovative initiatives and case studies in our innovative responses tracker. 
um, demonstrating that the public sector can certainly innovate when it needs to. But the question is, how can we help organisations innovate when the need isn't quite as obvious, when the need isn't quite as overbearing? How do we make sure that innovation is part of the, the standard practice of organisations so that we're ready for when the unexpected happens? Um, so I'm going to, uh, this will be a fairly conversational event today. And I'm going to start by asking Michael some questions about uh, your experience with uh, innovation at IP Australia. So Michael, um, would you mind telling us a little bit about IP Australia's innovation journey? What are, what are some of the key sorts of milestones along that journey for you and, and seeing the organization change from just, well, become a, a one where innovation is really given some attention and thought about as part of the strategic direction of the organization. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, so um, just a little bit of background for those who might not be familiar with who we are. We at IP Australia are, of course, the government agency in Australia responsible for issuing intellectual property rights, that's patents, trademarks, designs, and plant figures rights. Um, we also have a responsibility as part of the government's innovation ecosystem to uh, promote awareness of IP rights and obviously administer the system so that our customers are able to access those rights uh, when they need them. We contribute to government advice uh, about the innovation system and particularly IP policy um, through our uh, parent department, the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Uh, uh, and we work very closely with the international system uh, to collaborate um, because it's just so important that those um, that, that IP rights are an integrated uh, integrated international system. Um, a really important part of understanding uh, how we operate is that um, although we are a government agency, we are a cost recovered agency. So we do have, um, and by cost recovered, we obviously charge, uh, we charge fees, uh, patent fees and, and, and trademark fees. Um, and uh, that funds our operations and it funds the investments in the IP system, administration system um, and all of our activities. So. That does give us um, quite a bit of financial independence, and that is a key, a key factor in our innovation journey. Um, and I think uh, it's important to remember that. Uh, so our journey, um, at the start, I need to give a shout out to my predecessor, Patricia Kelly, who was the Director General before me, um, she certainly was a pivotal person who led the organisation through the start of the innovation journey that we have been on. Um, probably uh, at least uh, at least for a good eight years, I would suggest. Uh, the approach we have been taken, we have been uh, taking, um, really came about um, in part uh, because there was a capability review that we did of the organization. Um, that uh, capability review certainly um, said lots of positive things, but also suggested that um, our culture and our approach and our embrace of innovation um, could increase. And Patricia and her executive team were champions of that approach. And having that uh, momentum from the leadership team was really, uh, really quite important. It was also um, important because of the focus on the importance of innovation to our country's economic growth and well-being, and IP Australia playing such an important role in that. Um, uh, uh, it gave momentum to the need to innovate and to be seen as um, an agency that practiced what we preached um, and to be able to embed that um, in our day-to-day -day activities. 
a first example of how to achieve that um, was the early establishment, I think, in 2012 of our Office of the Chief Economist. The Office of the Chief Economist allowed us to build up um, economic expertise and um, data and analysis uh, uh, that gave us a better structure for decision making and gave us tools that we could um, push forward into the innovation discussion around Australia. Um, that recognition started to build um, comfort uh, in a proactive approach to um, uh, having a say in what innovation meant and that, that comfort and that confidence um, started to also reflect through into the organisation itself. That allowed staff, and, and again, you know, there, are, there are many facets to this, that allowed um, uh, uh, the agency to establish uh, staff, um, uh, staff ideas and encourage ideas to bubble up uh, from staff. So uh, that meant that you had this sort of multi directional approach to innovation in, in the agency. And that meant people started to take risks, started to make use of the incredibly skilled people we have. We're obviously a, a highly technically based organization with people who have fantastic skills, particularly in the STEM field. Um, and it allowed that to be unleashed over time. So the, really the response to the review that I mentioned, that capability review, um, it got a commitment from the executive. Um, that commitment, sorry, this really important piece I want to mention, a commitment to also dedicate some of the budget of uh, what we did each year to in, explicitly to innovation. Um, so it was almost an acceptance that we couldn't be what we wanted to be unless we were prepared to um, dedicate some a small percentage, less than 1%, to our um, experimentation with technology and ideas um, so that we could innovate. And there was um, backing that sometimes those ideas might fail, but some might succeed. And that's certainly been the case that we've demonstrated since the journey took place. Um, I'm interested, when you talk about the capability review, um, Obviously, as you say, that was an important step, but you, you've worked in other major public sector organisations within the Australian Public Service. There's not exactly a shortage of, of such reviews or, or opportunities to, for an organisation to be a bit introspective and say, well, what are, we, what are we doing and what are we focusing on? What do you think mm -hmm. perhaps the, the difference was, I mean, it, none of those things are necessarily a burning platform, but obviously IP Australia has, use that and leverage that to be a platform. Do you think mm -hmm. that's just a matter of, of deliberate strategic choice by, by leadership or was there something particular, do you think? I think, um, I think well, let me, uh, you're certainly right. Um, it's, not, um, it's not the first time a capability review of an agency has suggested that you needed to unleash innovation and power staff and, and, and take leadership and those sorts of things. Um, certainly a lot of the credit goes to the leadership team here at the time, and I wasn't, I wasn't part of that at the time, um, for embracing the opportunity, um, particularly through the clarity that was adopted of the vision and the strategic plan that the capability, the capability plan suggested was part of uh, what was next. So as part of that need to establish a very clear uh, strategic direction, a roadmap to 2030, which we uh, published and which we have incorporated every year into our, our annual corporate plan, um, that set out very clear um, ambitions. A lot of it, obviously, uh, and you could you could say that, um, it took a three horizons approach. So obviously, um, in the outer horizon uh, towards 20, 
28 to the late, you know, the late part of this decade, obviously um, it's very high level and it's really guardrails, but um, it sets the scene for experimentation and how we're going to get to that. And we simply cannot get to that without taking some risk and without taking some leaps. So that, that constantly keeps us asking the question, um, okay, so we've been very successful in the short term, but given our original ambition, given our original um, desire to be a certain type of organisation in these out years, how do we get there? How do we, and, and, and it, forces, it forces us to keep asking those questions. So the capability review um, did um, result in really quite um, quite a strong and 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 almost difficult discussion because it wasn't easy to sit down and nut out what this looked like. Um, the team worked very hard to um, establish this three horizon vision across different parts of our organization so that we break it down into operational excellence, service excellence, and value-added objectives. And um, they, they um, uh, ratchet out over time uh, in the horizons, and it, it, it every part of the agency could see that there was ambition that was being established uh, over the long term. And uh, the only way we were going to achieve that was with some risk and so it was that response and that um, deeply collaborative effort over time to establish the vision and the strategic roadmap that really set the scene after the capability review. Um, before I dive into some more specifics perhaps it would be helpful for the audience to hear a little about some of what this approach has led to or, or how has how this innovative drive manifested? Are, th are there a couple of projects that you would point to in particular that you're proud of as, as an organization in terms of how this innovation has actually been demonstrated and, and showing value for the organization and its uh, stakeholders? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to put in a plug for your own case study, a long case study, Alex, of about 30 odd pages that is published, of course, through the OECD website and the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation website, um, which goes into some detail, in fact, um, on the examples um, that we have provided. But I, wanna, I, I, I do want to call out um, just a couple, if I can. Uh, the first uh, was trademark, Australian trademark search. It was introduced in February 2017. Um, and I want to call out that we collaborated very closely with a private sector company here in Australia uh, that um, helped us build trademark search. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the innovations that we have been taking, sometimes they're internally generated, but quite often we do them through leveraging the expertise of people outside the organization, either in a commercial relationship or in a, or in a partnership. Um, so the trademark search um, was quite revolutionary, combining image searching and machine learning technology to drastically simplify the types of um, searches, the results of the trademark searching that broke down barriers for users. Um, so instead of using text descriptions, they were um, able to upload a logo and instantaneously search IP Australia's database of over 400,000 images. Um, and the returns meant, the, the returns on similarity reduced the chance that applications would be rejected. It saved time for businesses uh, uh, and provided an easier experience for the user, our, our customers. Um, and, and so that utilization of a collaborative design approach uh, with our customers, with our internal um, technicians and with the private sector partner, um, with, with, it allowed lots of prototyping, it allowed feedback from users. Uh, it had a great 
impact, and the impact is measured in a 54% reduction in calls related to trademark searching. So we that, that's calls into our call center. Um, so that really demonstrates that businesses can uh, use the right tools to, to meet their information needs. Um, it saved them time and money. Uh, and it was something completely new for us. Um, and that, that model and that, that company, that private sector company from Australia, um, has partnered with similar offices now globally um, uh, to roll that out and I think uh, probably achieve um, uh, you know, lots of lots of efficiencies for businesses globally. I should also um, mention Trademark Assist. Um, that was a tool that we introduced in 2018. It's an interactive tool designed to educate and assist unrepresented trademark applicants um, through the initial stages of an application process. Um, the information is tailored to a specific customer's circumstances and it suggests information to help Again, it's using um, machine learning uh, to help applicants submit high quality applications. Um, that enables users, again, to upload images and logos. Uh, over 41,000 users since the launch of that in 2018. Um, and there, there has been an 18% increase in successful applications for users who apply through that trademark assist tool. Um, so again, um, using particularly machine learning, IT technology to bring efficiencies to, to the users, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. So um, I, there are a range of other things. There's um, an IP policy register, for example. Um, there's um, uh, other initiatives around a virtual assistant. Um, we have a huge technical program that um, involved quite the appetite for risk in terms of updating our internal processes. Um, and you know, I mentioned at the start that we have dedicated um, money to our internal budget to some risky uh, programs. Um, at the moment, that's called um, Cognitive Futures, which you know, allows us to do some experimentation in particularly AI and machine learning and how to apply that. So um, they're just some of the examples of what we're doing. But not all of it, I'd have to say, is sexy and IT based. Um, a lot of what we do and the culture that we're trying to encourage, some of it's high yards too. And um, uh, one of the examples of that would be changes to our internal quality assurance system um, that ranges from our ISO ISO compliance through to how we assure quality on the production of our examination reports and that's a hard hard task uh, it's quite complex uh, it's been passionately driven by one of the deputies director generals the Commissioner of Patents uh, here at IP Australia. But it's very hard to neatly describe. And it's one of the frustrations I have is that some of the great innovations that we undertake um, are almost deathly dull to an external audience. And I'd love to understand, I'd love someone creative out there to be able to take my two page story on, on improving our quality assurance mechanisms um, and turn it into a digestible communication of um, the innovation that it really, it really is at the core of it. Anyway, so yes, it goes from the sexy to the bright and sexy through to the not quite so bright and sexy. Well, I think that's, that's one of the fundamental challenges of innovation is you're trying to sell an idea that you can't fully spell out because you don't have the, the, the comparative references or examples to say, this is what we're doing, because you're, you're trying to do something new. Now, in that respect, I mean, uh, IT projects have a, a mixed history in, in the uh, public sector. Um, we, we know they don't all go smoothly, and there's a lot of learning involved sometimes. How has the organisation managed the, the risk involved in 
doing some some fairly new stuff. I mean, machine learning and and some of these other elements that you're talking about weren't natural territory for the for the organisation. How has how has that risk been engaged with, and and how have you managed that experimentation process, knowing that that things aren't always going to go right when you're doing something really new? Um. I don't think we have all the answers uh, for that. I can just, you know, describe our own experience. Um, I think, uh, firstly, there was this. There's an explicit, an explicit um, acceptance that we are going to spend a small percentage, one percent of our budget uh, on this experimentation, particularly around um, uh, doing some early prototyping, some agile um, methodology behind uh, people's ideas to work up, to work up a prototype in collaboration with the business area, um, the IT guys, the business area, the customer, the third party from the sector with expertise, um, iterating these ideas and 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 really testing them in a in a prototype. Um, uh, it is a classic agile methodology that was that was applied to this, um, and so that helped us to identify fast veils, immediate concerns to the business, um, those, those sorts of things, and that. Um, was particularly useful in the building and application of AI tools, for example. Um, we have been at the other extreme, uh, where um, uh, we call it our Rights in One Rio program, uh, which we rolled out for trademarks. It essentially meant, uh, and that was completed late last year, it was a very long and large IT build again with a partner called Pega Systems, who um, had been a great partner with us um, throughout that time and continued to be so. Uh, and that um, we took on quite a bit of risk in that, um, in a in a classic um, big project sort of way. Um, and partly that's because our systems are unique. Uh, and bespoke, we can't go and buy an IP or patent examination tool off the shelf. Uh, and uh, so that's sorry, I've just my I've just realised I've gone onto screensaver. I'm hoping you can still hear me. Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, good. Um, uh, so I was just reading that um, our Rio project, quite big and um, and quite risky. Um, when I came into the organisation. Uh, September 2018, one of the first things our external advisors told me, our audit committee told me, was that um, we were maxed out on risk. Uh, and that's an unusual thing to hear in the public sector. Uh, and partly that was because we had, um, we had at least four very large projects on foot that were fundamentally transforming uh, the agency's IT systems and the way it worked physically in the in the building. Um, uh, so that was that was an entertaining way to start a new job was to have um, all of the external private sector people telling me that this public sector agency was maxed out on risk uh, and that I needed to be aware of that. So um, the agile methodology certainly helped, um, but the appetite for risk was really important as well. And the leadership to accept failure uh, and fast failure through the agile methodology and the backing of experts to get us through and over the humps of really big risk-taking pieces were all important uh, to um, how we produce these um, successful, successful examples of innovation, I think. Uh, thank you. So uh, one of the things he I'm hearing in that is uh, the engagement with the, the private sector is, is important when you're building up these capabilities. Uh, how, how do you find working with uh, the private sector on, on these truly sort of uh, 
where you're, you're really learning and, and you can't necessarily explicitly state this is exactly what we want or this is exactly what we need. And you have to allow room for that, that mutual learning journey and that discovery process. How, how has that worked for the organization? Um, there's good and bad pieces to that. I think it comes down to, again, the risk that you're prepared to take. Um, and I'm coming here from the perspective of the traditional risk that you might take on for a government procurement. Um, uh, because, you know, nailing, nailing down in a government procurement contract every possible output to the nth degree, uh, defining exactly what you want, um, is really how people nail down the risk. Um, this it was obviously about talking about the outcome and the intent, the customer experience, uh, and therefore there was less definition because it was more about the outcome. Um, that, that has been um, a fantastic collaboration uh, in most of our, um, most of our um, collaborations with the private sector. Um, I can call out Agile Digital, uh, who helped build um, our, uh, our award-winning um, trademark, trademark uh, AI tools. Um, Pega Systems has been fantastic as well. Um, uh, uh, we've had uh, we've had some experiences that have not been so good because. Um, uh, it it just you know that the, the partnership wasn't as fruitful. Um, I, I'd have to say I suspect and and because I came in certainly at the tail end of a lot of this journey, um, I've been there less than two years. A lot of these, my observation would be a lot of the partnerships are very um, built on long term trust, um, really good working relationships at a personal level. Um, and the executive team, particularly the CIO, worked very closely with uh, some of these partners, uh, but then so did all of the team. And they were encouraged to work collaboratively and see the private sector partners as collaborators. And that made a difference, I think. Um, just taking a slightly different tack now, uh, COVID-19 was a bit of a, a shock this year for, for everyone. Uh, I'm curious to know how the the organisation coped with the, the the shifts required by by the crisis. Uh, I know that it hasn't been as extreme in Australia as in other places, but it's required a different shift in, in different ways of working by everyone. Um, how do you think the the groundwork that had already been done in IP Australia around working differently and, and thinking differently helped uh, when the crisis struck, or did it help? Um, well, it certainly did, uh, purely, um, and it's, it's not earth shattering. We, um, we certainly had adopted activity based working in the office. Uh, we have, we, we really have just finished that project when, when COVID hit, and that was one of the big projects I referred to when, uh, the external people were telling me that, um, our risk, our risk was maxed out. Um, uh, again, my predecessor uh, certainly led that move to um, activity-based working. Um, we don't call it hot desking. It's not hot desking. It's about making sure that you have the spaces available across our physical workplace to um, to suit the type of work you're doing. If you're doing a pattern examination and you you, know, you need to do those you know, for the next three days and put your head down and do it. There are places and appropriate desks for you to do that. If you are uh, doing a stand up or an agile scrum, all those sorts of activities, there are, there are places to do that. So we had to match the IT rollout to that. So everyone was on a laptop. Everyone has, uh, there's really good Wi-Fi throughout the physical spaces, um, good audio visual equipment to do activities like this, uh, webinars and, and um, VC meetings. Um, so that was, that was fantastic. But we had also um, 
pretty flexible workplace arrangements, um, almost almost to the point of um, if you wanted to work flexibly or needed to work flex flexibly, you can pick up your laptop and your phone and work you know, from almost anywhere in the country, um, provided you have that connectivity and provided that it suited the activity that you were expected to be working on. So it's always, um, always um, in the context of what is required for people to do their job, what the business needs, what IPS really needs from our staff at that point in time, um, and that flexible arrangement and a strong trust relationship with the staff um, allowed um, for us to pick up and move very quickly when it time for, came time for us to be working from home. So we um, had invested in the infrastructure, in the property, um, in the workplace policies, but we had also invested um, in the cultural change. Um, there's no point creating these workspaces if managers are going to insist that they have to see their staff all the time physically within 10 meters or within a shout from their office. Um, that's what we were actively discouraging um, so that um, managers in particular um, needed to encourage staff to embrace the opportunities that the new physical infrastructure provided. So um, there was a very strong change management piece that went with our physical transformation. All of that was completed beautifully, I have to say, in a very traditional project management style um, a very traditional Prince sort of waterfall style stuff um, that meant we were on time and on budget uh, and it worked really well. Um, the, um, uh, the result was we could move from a hundred people working remotely on an average day uh, out of a thousand staff to a thousand people working remotely in one week. We basically scaled up uh, in that one week. So it really did hold us in good stead because it meant that we were used to virtual teams. Um, we were used to the niggles of um, uh, technology not always working at the right time, at the right place. Uh, it meant people were familiar with different activities that they could do to stay in contact. Managers were able to manage remote teams. Um, and that's not to say it went perfectly, um, but it certainly held us in good stead. And you know, um, as a director general who inherited that project, I'm very, very grateful when the crisis of COVID hit that we were so well placed through the decisions of my predecessor two years earlier and through the fantastic team that carried that out um, and finished it on time and on budget. Um, earlier you spoke of, of the three horizons and, and thinking through the future till 2030. Um, while some people had always talked about a pandemic coming, I don't think anyone had scheduled it in for this year. Are there any particular no. lessons you'd take away from, from the crisis for how IP Australia engages with an uncertain future where the unpredictable can, can happen and change everything in a moment? Um, the first thing that springs to mind is the confidence that we can do it. Um, that's, that's a really significant um, a significant thing. Um, I, I should also say that um, many people, I think many people forget or many people um, don't realise that of course when H1N1 happened, uh, however many years ago that was, um, the Australian government developed the national pandemic plan and each agency developed a national pandemic plan as part of our business continuity process. Um, we, we did pick up our national pandemic, our, our business continuity pandemic response plan, and we implemented it uh, to, the, to the letter, essentially. Um, 
and uh, it's interesting as it turns out we may also have been lucky that um, you know we do as we should regular business continuity exercises um, and we just happened to do a global pandemic exercise in February this year um, that um, that was a bit of a trial run for what we might need to do when COVID hit. Um, so a little bit of good luck, but a lot of good planning and a lot of, um, I, I, I think that is a good lesson for all agencies actually, that that national pandemic plan that was established early on as a response to a unlikely, what seemed to be an unlikely but catastrophic event, um, that planning, which was updated pretty much annually um, since N1H, H1N1, forgive me if I got that wrong, um, uh, that's a very good example. So um, in terms of uh, what we do as an agency, um, we, we do uh, a little bit of scenario planning as part of our strategic risk um, management. Um, I keep falling back on risk because it really does go hand in hand with with innovation um, and the culture that we need to establish uh, to ensure that our, our innovation can be uh, achieved, our, our um, aspiration for innovation can be achieved. Um, uh, so I suspect um, this experience of uh, the global pandemic for COVID-19 means that we'll be, I think everyone will be less dismissive of thinking through some of these scenarios as we move into the future. I'm going to uh, take, start using some of the questions that uh, people have suggested in the chat and then we'll come back to some, some closing ones a bit later. Uh, so Julian has asked, uh, can you suggest any strategies that technical staff can use to communicate technically complex, innovative ideas to non-technical staff? Uh, uh, this, is a, this is a very good question because some of what I haven't discussed to date is the importance of communication um, within the agency to get everyone on the same page. Um, so if I can just sort of deal with that and then I'll come back to the specifics of Julian's question. Um, the change management piece I mentioned briefly before, um, you can't do change management without really good internal communications. Um, that comes with, uh, that comes from uh, the top down. Um, you know, staff need to be hearing about um, the direction, the strategic objectives, the mission, uh, the appetite for risk. Uh, and people need to understand clearly how that risk is to be calibrated across the agency. Uh, so that's that's a that's that can be quite a sophisticated communication challenge. And you would think that by now I would know to update my screensaver, but I think it's set by my security team. So I will just keep shaking a mouse or something. Um, I think. Um, the communications piece is obviously very, you know, it's a very critical plank in being able to achieve the cultural shifts needed to adopt an innovation approach, uh, uh, you know, to become an innovative agency that has an appetite for risk and, and, the, and the mechanisms to adopt risk. Um, I, so I think in terms of how technical staff can explain difficult or complex ideas to non-technical people. Um, I think there are, you've always got, I think always got to communicate in, in two levels. Um, you have to, you have to continue to communicate um, in relation to the, the core strategic piece. So I keep, for example, coming back to, and it's, it sounds like a cliche, but um, at the, you know, when I'm explaining what IP Australia does um, to my mother, um, I'm prepared to say it's all about helping the government create jobs and growth. Um, now that's 
Some would say heavily simplified and cliched. Others would say that um, it makes sense to them. Uh, but then you just basically have to have the layers of communication from that very high level around why are we here, what's the vision, and bring it down in examples to um, why you're suggesting the technical solution that you're suggesting. That's the best I can come up with. Um, to some extent, you have to rely on your audience. I would not describe myself as a technical staff member. Um, and so the technical part of my agency uh, often have to bear with me and simplify things a little bit when they're trying to explain things to me. Um, uh, so you do have an onus yourself to try and do some background reading and try and you know, be vaguely aware of what's going on around the world as well. And sometimes I get people to come back and explain to me things two or three different times. Um, I have to say, um, uh, uh, some some presentations that you get on why we do things the way we do and the technical issues around them. Um, and, you know, um, patent examination, trademark examination, and the, and the artificial intelligence rules, the international rules that go with all of that, um, uh, how to build the algorithms around that. Um, these are complex, uh, complex things that take some time to understand the nuance of and and you know um we recently farewelled someone who'd been working with us for 40 years so they had a very deep deep understanding of uh, the complexity of nuance um but it's only through case studies and layered examples i think the layered communications that you really help to get the message across thank you uh another question uh this one from joan munro were any of the innovations uh, completely radical and game-changing or were they mostly improvements? Uh, so this is, this is, um, this was an interesting piece. I think um, the use, I think shifting, and I should have my stats in front of me, but shifting um, from an agency that was certainly not 100% digital, in fact, probably 50% to 100% digital in a few years, um, that was pretty radical in terms of the speed of adoption of technology and the change that customers had to go through um, to move from essentially paper to 100% digital. Um, and the internal processes to achieve that um, in a short period of time, relatively short period of time, um, they're pretty radical. Um, uh, if I could explain simply the change to quality management systems, um, uh, and you see the change that took place with that over less than 12 months uh, to go from one system to a completely new system uh, to build the IT behind that, to go through the change management with staff, the complexities with respect to how people's performance is, is um, assessed, uh, the incentives for people um, to do uh, more, than, more than standard, um, the reversal of uh, cultural impediments to um, collaboration. They can be quite radical, radical shifts. The use of AI tools in patent examination, um, uh, that's, that's pretty radical. It's taking, it's letting, and, and it's radical because of the way patent examination has been done for many, many years with deep experience from the people that have been doing that and doing that well, but then freeing them up so their expertise can be applied to quality just sort of benefit of AI uh, is taking the mundane away. Um, that's also that's also pretty radical. But you know the rollout, the rollout of uh, um, the rollout of a comprehensive activity-based working scheme, not so radical. Certainly been done many places before, um, but doing it simultaneously with complete overhauls of our trademark uh, platform, the migration of 500 million records 
um, seamlessly, almost seamlessly, there were a couple of hiccups, but pretty seamlessly for that quantity, um, uh, that was all pretty radical as well, I think. Sorry, I don't know if that answered Joan's question. Um, just building on that, I guess, uh, in, in uh, our work at the observatory, we talk about there being different types of innovative activity, whether it be enhancement oriented, mission oriented, or anticipatory yeah. or, or adaptive. I'm curious, do, so um, we often see a lot of innovative activity happen in the adaptive space, uh, the enhancement oriented space. Um, do you think that needs to happen before you start tackling the more radical and, and bigger ambition stuff in the mission and anticipatory or can they be done simultaneously or? Um, uh, uh, thanks, actually. It's a, um, something I wanted to come back to. Um, as I mentioned, when I uh, came into the role, the risk profile was maxed out. Um, the level of change, we were jumping uh, quite significantly in terms of the adoption of um, digital technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, and that was fantastic. You know, there was a real buzz to the place. The, the uh, it really was a enormous cultural shift led from the top and led by by key people around the organisation, but with a lot of buy-in from from people. Um, it was some at some point though it felt right in you know, in the last um 12 to 6 months uh to be aware of the sustained pressure that was putting on people certainly um, part of getting that shift was to continually say change is the new constant change is the new constant but after a while that does um create potentially where you've got um, uh, stresses in the organization where you've got some people way ahead of the way ahead of the curve in terms of risk appetite and, and ability to charge forward and the people that are needing to to keep up so um, uh, it was interesting we've been debating this in my mind um, uh, it was something I was mulling over for a long time and I I, I just happened to be uh, talking to a colleague who um, runs uh, BizLab, which is the um, innovation lab, um, Jada McCann, uh, in the Department of uh, Industry, Science, Energy and Resources here in Canberra. Um, and she was able to point me to the, um, the uh, innovation facets model that um, OPSI have, have, well, I, I think it's OPSI's, I'm not sure, could be adopted or adapted um, at OPSI. Um, but that construct between sustaining change, transformational change, um, mission-oriented innovation, uh, enhancement-oriented innovation, allowed us that, that framework allowed us to talk as a leadership team about where we felt comfortable, what we'd been through, and to and work out how to sustain the pace of change and innovation that meant we weren't going to be breaking apart. It kept us, kept us together. So initially, certainly, very transformational change in terms of not what we were doing, because if you look at us from outside, um, you know, we're still develop, developing and delivering on Australia's IP rights system. Um, if you talk amongst the IP um, community of the world, um, you would start to see things like our trademark assist search tools and, and the use of AI and our activity based working that was starting to become quite novel and transformational in the context of um, uh, IP. But we've also calibrated now um, to take some of the pressure off uh, in terms of our risk appetite, not our risk appetite, but our, um, the the, the, the quantum of risk that we were living with and the, the change um, exhaustion to some extent. Um, and so the innovation has moved on to more project driven, enhanced or adaptive innovation. I think more adaptive innovation is the word uh, that I would use. So it's um, about optimizing change uh, and the models that 
your your organization have um, investigated and published really helped us as an executive to put that into into context um, when when working out where to from here. Thank you. Um, just thinking about uh, well, innovation is, is quite a, a hard thing. Um, it's not not an easy task, uh, particularly in a bureaucratic and hierarchical setting. Uh, what what would you suggest that is most helpful or useful for people to do when their leadership and their organisation may not be as committed or, or ready for an innovation approach as, as say, IP Australia? I think, um, yeah, uh, I I think you can always achieve innovation within the context of your uh, um, your work, um, and if you have if you have ideas about how your job can um, uh, be improved, the processes can be eliminated. You can take a quantum leap and achieve a better outcome. Um, I think. Um, you, and, and, and you're asking me if you don't have that that um, leadership at the top to help you uh, push that through. Uh, you have to um, sometimes ensure that you've got the engagement of your customer or your stakeholders. Um, uh, examples elsewhere where it's been done, and that's you know that's one of the. Uh, it's one of the difficulties that you have is that you know, these ways of managing that internal risk averseness um, uh, can be a bit of a trap sometimes because uh, you know, for us, you can't look around and see you know, multiple examples of where people have done these innovations before because there's, you know, limited, um, there's a limited number of IP offices in the world. Um, and it's important that sometimes you just have to take take a leap so the agile methodology, the customer focus, the experimentation, the fast fail, um, the acceptance that you can have a budget dedicated to this and that's consistent with your mission um, are all really, really useful. I'm saying this from a relatively safe place because as I said before, um, we're a cost recovered organization and uh, to some extent, our customers, uh, the people that we support, that's the owners of IP rights and the people intending or needing or wanting IP rights in the future, expect, expect us to be running a really good IP administration for them. Um, and it would be almost negligent for us not to be looking in the same way they do at innovation and making sure we were adopting that ourselves. So, um, you know, we're um, in terms of innovation, um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're in a relatively safe space because of that, because our, our key stakeholders and customers are innovators themselves and they understand what's expected um, and that you have some sort of, um, you need to be able to do that failure. So um, it's good to have that support from where we sit. Um, sometimes it's a bit trickier when you don't have that um, that level of support. Uh, so you do have to talk about risk, talk about managing change, um, and talk about that. You know, looking at, I think, the innovation facets model that you guys have developed can be a tool that says, hey, we're not going to leap forward with this. We're not talking about anticipatory innovation. We're not talking even about transformative in innovation. We're talking about enhancements. We're talking about um, adaption of what we do. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, you can put it in that context and, and push forward with the innovation. Um, and then once you've got that track record, of course, it's easier to do the transformative stuff. So it works both ways. In, in IP Australia, big transformative innovation, we're moving to an longer term enhanced enhancements, which um, require more whole of agency approaches, I suspect, and therefore, uh, we've basically um, demonstrated through big transformative in innovations that we can do it, that there's success, that it feels good, 
um, you know, the, the buzz across the agency is really good as a result of that. It does shift the culture and it means that some of the hard nuts that take years to unpick, um, that adaptive innovation can be brought to bear on that. I think in the scenario you're putting forward, um, you basically probably have to start with the adaptive innovation to get the comfort and the confidence to then move forward into the transformative. If you can do it both at the same time, by all means, great. Um, what do you think still needs to be done at IP Australia to really integrate an innovative outlook and practice? Uh, there's, um, uh, we need to refresh probably our uh, 2030 roadmap and our strategic plan um, to show people that it is constantly moving. We don't want people to settle into this comfort that, oh yes, we did that once and now we can all move towards it. Um, I suspect we have to revisit that constantly. I mean, a three horizons approach should mean that your three horizons are constantly um, evolving. Um, and it's probably time for us to, uh, uh, to have a look at that and to stretch out the next few years to roll it forward. Um, and to consider the world has changed a lot, even in the short time since that um, first horizon scanning exercise, mega trends, inputs, and, and setting up that strategic plan. A lot has changed. It's probably sound to revisit that and remind people in the organization that it is a constant and that we do need to be um, vigilant about what we're preparing for, what future scenarios we're, we're preparing for and be uh, ready for that, but also an eager participant in that. Um, I think uh, the risk culture piece, we did look at our risk maturity models in the organization and our risk maturity models in some areas, in some segments of our organization. And I don't mean verticals, I mean, um, you know, horizontals in terms of um, sort of that just below middle management level, um, indicated that we had a problem with um, not, not people being risk averse, just not conscious of risk um, in a way that they can talk about it. Um, uh, which is interesting because it means I, I don't quite know if people are doing risk management and don't realize that there's a way to, um, uh, you know, a framing of it. That means you can, you know, you, that, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about risk appetites and tolerances um, and maturity. Uh, but I think, I think it's just a case of building up people's confidence in risk and how to deal with risk. And, that's a responsibility of everyone in the organization and we keep emphasizing that. So I think embedding that culture of risk management and maturity across the organization will mean people have a better framing of how to deal with change and how to adopt uh, and, and consider new ideas. And the leadership setting, setting the right appetite for that is really important. Uh, another question from Joan, uh, have you had to change the kind of staff you recruit and retain in order to achieve this culture shift? Um, I'd, say, I'd say not really, um, but we are certainly putting a massive amount of work into our workforce planning. Um, I would argue our workforce planning is probably the most important strategic thing that we have happening and innovation, risk, communication, um, a front and center of what we have articulated as expected from all of our staff, no matter whether they are patent examiners with you know, PhD in physics through to, um, through to um, uh, the project managers that are coming in from the private sector to help us um, with particular niche projects um, through to you know, um, the way we approach our financial, balancing our financial models and our production models. It's, it's really important that um, uh, our workforce reflects those skills and the appetite that we're trying to set from the top. So we haven't we haven't explicitly changed that, but we're investing in staff to give them those extra softer skills, I suspect. 
Uh, a question from Rob Chalmers. Uh, do you use failure reports? Uh, how do you learn from the, the failures that, that might occur or the, the experiments that don't work as, as hoped? Um, uh, probably not as systematically as I would like, to be honest. Um, we, we have had a failure recently um, in that um, a project that was commenced um, our governance around it probably wasn't as strong as it needed to be um, and it hasn't achieved all of the outcomes we wanted and some people got impatient and pulled in different directions and you know it wasn't um, the greatest success uh, we we have certainly um, we're you know we're trying to fix the problem, but we're trying to work out what the uh, lessons are from that. And I've mentioned, I've mentioned failure of, I, I don't mean governance in our project management sense, I mean project in terms of the strategic agency governance of what that was about, what we were trying to do and making sure we all stayed on the same page. And as difficulties came about, we should have um, probably um, made sure that we were looking at it um, in the context, in fact, of those three horizons um, and bringing it back to how we are achieving this in the long term according to those three horizons. Um, so um, uh, I think we are learning from failures, but I would like to bring some more formal um, evaluation and uh, lesson learned type of um, uh, routine into into uh, the activities that we take undertake. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answered Rob's question. Um, question from Julian. Yeah, it's a particularly good example. Um, I'd love for I'd love to know who's doing that beautifully, so I can copy it. Yes, I think we've only ever seen it really done in in agencies that have a an extremely high cost of, of failure, whether it be the airport, uh, the transport sort of industry or, or military or, or sometimes... Yeah, it's, no. No. <laughs> it's harder in the... the, the more no, thank goodness. Good um, question from Julian. Are there any bottom-up methods you would recommend for young people with technical backgrounds? So I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to add to this question. Um, what as a leader, what do you see as the most effective ways? Or what, what, who are the people you've seen being most effective at driving change from the bottom up? And what's that? What's been? What characteristics or, or traits do you see um, there? Um. That is a good question. I think um, there's um, having um, essentially it's um, sorry, my head's just going in lots of different directions as I'm providing advice to a young technician who wants to know um, how to be innovative and, and push that through in the world. Um, Having obviously the awareness of what keeps the bosses up at night is really important because, dare I say it, I fall back on risk again. Um, managing, managing, or understanding that the framework that your bosses have is what are what are my strategic objectives here, and what are my strategic risks, and trying to achieve that, and then what do I need to do to manage all of that. Um, so showing that you get it and and can help in framing your proposed innovation in that context is um, really, really important, I think. Um, uh, don't oversell your innovation. Um, uh, be prepared to fail fast and, and explain the risks and uh, be open to evaluating um, whether it's working or not. Uh, one sure way, one sure way to uh, not achieve success um, is to try and 
hide uh, something going not well um, when it should have been a past fail. Um, to continue, uh, trying to kill a project is one of the hardest things on earth, I think. Um, you know, a project that really should have been killed. Um, and then, uh, and I've heard that from many people more experienced than me. Um, uh, so that helps someone stand out, actually. When you can say, look, we're going to give this a go, we're going to give it for six months. You know what? No, nah, didn't work. But but we've learned some lessons and we're going to um, we're going to apply that to something else. Um, so uh, that's a key thing. Coming coming with that, of course, is communication skills. Um, you've got to be able to um, to talk and articulate and framing the framing of um, picking up the phone and doing your homework, talking to the customers talking to the customers and the stakeholders and bringing that evidence base with you to say, um, hey, or, or, or proposing. Uh, in fact, I had someone do this with me the other day. Um, they, were at a, they were at a function. Um, they uh, had been talking to some local innovators here in Canberra, where we are. Um, and these local innovators were delighted that someone from the IP office was there uh, at their workshop. Um, and so they proposed this ongoing collaboration now, um, you know, for a young, uh, young public servant, civil servant, um, they were a bit unsure about what the politics of all of this was. So they came with a proposal that was about what could be achieved, what the context was, of course, how it fitted into the bigger picture. They provide regular updates, they seek guidance. Um, and that's going remarkably well, that, that activity. and. It's perfectly, it's a bottom-up grassroots um, adoption of the strategic directions that we're trying to establish um, from the board of the agency. Um, uh, so it's very localized to, this, to her team at the moment, but you can see that that will, that practice, that those processes, the practice, the habits, Will, will will grow over time across the agency and um, that's really heartening, really good stuff. Uh, a last question for you from me. Um, uh, you've mentioned uh, quite a few things and, and some of this is covered in, in the case study uh, that we did together as well, but uh, I think some of the key points you've mentioned today around some of the success, success factors have been, you know, there's been a roadmap with uh, clear ambitions. Um, you've engaged with the with different thinking about the future. There's been a dedicated budget um, and a bit of independence and safety. There's been an ongoing strategic commitment and willing leadership. Uh, you've had skilled staff. You've been using agile. There's been an explicit appetite around risk, although that's always an ongoing process. There's been some deliberate change management. Uh, scenario planning, a lot of persistence, and a focus on, on communication. What advice would you give others setting down this path, though, that, uh, I guess, when you started this job, what, what advice wish, did you wish you'd known um, in trying to pursue an innovation journey like this? Um, mm -hmm. I think you do. I think you do. When 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 we are talking whole of agency change and innovation, um, it does take time to understand where the agency has come from, and I do think that's important to appreciate um, where the agency and the and the and your people are on that innovation journey. And, and it took me a while, and that's why I found um, the facets model um, so useful, was because it allowed me to understand that the, the, the people in the agency were at different, um, different parts of that model. Um, and once you understand that, that's okay. It starts to make, it starts to make sense. People move at different paces. Um, and um, you can't just, it's not, 
it's just not as simple as a conductor waving a, a, a baton at an orchestra and everyone moving in sync. It just does not work like that. It's much more organic. Um, it's much more open to personalities and stresses and, and different messaging from, from leaders. And um, so I think uh, the complexity of that and having, uh, you know, um, it takes time to, to get across that. Uh, so, uh, if someone could have given me that, you know, you know, downloaded, downloaded that into my head uh, on day one, that would have saved everyone a lot of time, and I imagine some of my team a lot of pain. Um, but uh, uh, there's no short way; you just have to feel your way through that to um to get where you're going. And um, Fortunately, as I say, we had, I think the one thing that I'm pleased I didn't um, question too much was that strategic roadmap. Um, letting, you know, the, the, the team had put a hell of a lot of work into um, that roadmap and it still has held us in very good stead. Um, and that had a lot of widespread adoption. In fact, funnily enough, I think um, it was one of the people might have argued over all sorts of different things, including the pace of change and the pace of innovation and the risk appetite on different things. But everyone was locked on to the strategic roadmap. Um, and so ultimately, that's what helped steer the course because everyone had that common touchstone. And that was really important. I um i think that fits nicely with uh, some of our thinking and uh, our innovation determinants model that if you have a strong sense of clarity uh, it makes everything easier because innovation is always going to come second to the the things that are clear the things that you are going to be measured on unless you have a really firm understanding of why you're doing it and why it's important um yeah before we end i'm just going to share uh, one last thing um so this discussion i think has been very rich and very useful and I thank you so much michael for this um uh, we, we at the observatory are working towards uh, an event uh, well a mix, a mix of events uh, being held all around the world called government aftershock an unconventional event for unconventional times in november where the aim is to uh, really help public sector agencies and, and their partners in the private sector and not-for-profit to reflect on this big shock, to consider uh, what it means, to think about what the crisis has shown governments, uh, and what it's revealed about our assumptions and shown us that you know, a lot of the things that we thought true uh, are true in different ways now. Uh, so I'd encourage everyone to uh, have a look and, and think about being involved. Um, we'll make sure that we share the case study uh, to all those who have um, signed up today and uh, share with you the, the YouTube clip and link. Um, and of course, you can subscribe to our newsletter as well. Um, all in all, I'd like to give you a warm and hearty thanks to, to you, Michael, for um, for sharing your experiences and your time with us today. Uh, I think that's been really important. Uh, I will shout out to other organizations. We're keen to, to hear from others who have had a long-standing commitment and involvement with an innovation approach. Uh, we think there's a lot to learn from those organizations that have managed that. Um, so if there, there are others out there who'd like to volunteer to be guinea pigs to do uh, for a case study, I uh, would love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, thank you, everyone. And uh, just uh, if you've got any last word, Michael, or just um, thank you very much for having me. And I think um, just another plug, really, for the case study because I think um, this discussion um, has been uh, has been good and informal. But I think um, the, your case study um, really does set it out 
um, quite nicely and, and obviously had a lot of input from the key players um, here at IP Australia um, because I don't really regard myself as one of those. Um, I think there is a lot of people um, who did a hard yards of innovation in IP Australia uh, before I got to it, to the agency and certainly have continued it while I've been here. But thank you, um, thank you to um, uh, the OECD and OPSI for continuing this series and contributing to the Australian Government's uh, Innovation Month 2020. Well, and I, I don't think you should uh, discount your contribution as much, uh, that much, Michael. I think it's one of the, the key things with this work is how this work is continued. Uh, there have been lots of people who start these things, but it's so important that that momentum is maintained across changes of leadership and across uh, time. So uh, I think you've been crucial in that respect for the organisation. Uh, yes, uh, one last shout out to Innovation Month 2020 and the Australian Public Sector Innovation Network. Um, I hope the rest of the uh, schedule for that goes well. Thank you all. Um, thanks you for joining us.